Thank you all for coming out this evening. I'd like to uh, uh, first, if I can, uh, give Mayor Mark Bricker in the city of Bay City a nice round of applause for providing this place for us to meet this evening. Thank you very much for that. My name's Nate McDonald. I'm the county judge for Matagorda County. And uh, as you all probably know by now, we had a very nice announcement uh, brought to us by our own Governor Rick Perry on uh, February 15th that we were going to have Tenaris uh, Steel locate in Matagorda County and build the world's preeminent uh, steel pipe manufacturing facility right here at Tenaris. Many of you here tonight have helped in this venue. Many, many of you have contributed your time, your talents, and everything that you have to give to bring this to Matagorda County. There's a group of four gentlemen that I serve with who've allowed me to help negotiate this. They've allowed me to pursue this for this county. They are your Matagorda County Commissioner's Court. I hope they're here tonight. I've seen several of them. Commissioners, would you all please stand and let's give you all a round of applause. The commissioners of Matagorda County, Texas. There's another group of citizens that I'd like to thank publicly for the work that they've put in on this project. Um, there are four of us that are paid. There are two more of us that came along because of their love for this county and the love for its citizens. They're seated right here in the front row. I don't believe I'll name all of their names, but I believe you'll all recognize them. And I hope that you'll take the opportunity to thank them as I have many, many times for the work they've done. I can tell you that uh, they've worked tirelessly, tirelessly, ladies and gentlemen, for eight months now to bring this to Matagorda County. So if I could have the Matagorda County Economic Development Team please stand up. Mitch, DC, Owen, Bobby, Cheryl, right here. As you all know, we've asked you all to come out tonight to learn a little bit about Tenaris and what Tenaris does, how they do business, what their plans are for our county. I'll tell you first and foremost, Tenaris is going to be a partner for this county. The one thing that they've impressed upon me from the very first day that I met this gentleman here on uh, June 25th, frankly, last year, I recall it well, uh, was that we're looking for a partner to build the world's most uh, advanced industrial complex. Now, when I say that, and I believe Armand will speak to that later this evening, we're not only looking to build pipe here, we're looking to show the world how to do industry. And that's what Tenaris is committed to for Matagorda County. <laughs> to add on just a little bit um, to how we got to this point, I'll mention, and I won't mention his name, but he'll know who he is when I, when I say this. On June 21st of last year, I got a call from a friend in Austin who asked me if I would be interested in a, in a very large manufacturing facility. <laughs> I said, well, I'd certainly like to visit with you about it. I'll have some time next week. And he proceeded to tell me, well, Judge, how about tomorrow? <laughs> this was on a Thursday, Thursday afternoon, frankly. And I said, well, Friday's up. It's kind of booked. He said, Judge, this is a very large, well-run company. I said, well, you know what? I think my calendar's clearing up as we speak. <laughs> And that's exactly how that proceeded. Uh, he and I and Owen Bluedow met the very following day in Commissioner's Court, um, in the courtroom. It wasn't, certainly wasn't in, in session, but the three of us met. And uh, I was satisfied, and Owen was certainly satisfied, that these were people that uh, certainly, certainly um, needed to be explored further, and we needed to have some talks with them. So uh, the gentleman proposed, well, uh, if you like, Judge, you know, I could set up a meeting with a company representative. And I said, well, that's great. I said, you know, next week's really full, but how about the following week? He says, how about Monday? <laughs> and, and I say, Monday a week? He says, no, 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 Monday as in three days. I say, okay, well, my calendar's clearing up as we speak, sir. And indeed it did. And again, on the following Monday, myself and Owen, and this gentleman here, Marcelo Rizabar, met for the very first time, again, in the Matagorda County Commissioner's Court, and visited for some hours and uh, agreed to move forward with a bid for their company to come here to Matagorda County. From that point, we've worked most literally seven days a week. Most days more than 10 or 12 hours. They typically are 14 to 16 hour days. And DC's smiling because most of hers are 18 hour days. 
But that's the way these folks work, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't an anomaly. <laughs> Many times when I go to Houston to visit with these two gentlemen, it's in the afternoon and it's late evening before we leave the offices. It's not that they're slave drivers, it's that they have a huge work ethic. It's the way their company's built and it's the way their people are built. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the way Matagorda County people are built. We have a work ethic second to none here. This company's a perfect fit for us. I can tell you as county judge, I meet with numerous, numerous companies wanting to enter our market. I can tell you that some of them are good, some of them are not so good, and the very few are exceptional. This, ladies and gentlemen, is exceptional. Tenaris is exceptional. These are the ones that have the same work ethic that we do. They're a company that's principled. They're a company that's forthright. You'll find that out about them for yourselves. Uh, you'll be able to talk to them here in a little bit later this evening, and we hope that you will. We hope you'll ask questions. We hope you'll gain an understanding of what they propose for Matagorda County. Um, with that, I believe we'd like to uh, move to a short video, if we could. Um, we're going to learn a little bit about the company, the project through the video. A couple of the team have seen this before, but I, I doubt that any of you have. It's, it's uh, quite impressive, and I hope you will pay attention. So at this time, if we could, uh, please dim the lights and let's play the video. Thank you for your attention. It is my distinct honor to be able to uh, announce today uh, that Tenaris has selected Matagorda County for the location of its new $1.3 billion steel pipe manufacturing facility. We have always said and we continue to believe that manufacturing in America uh, is viable, is feasible, is possible. It's very globalized and present in many countries in the world and there are a lot of opportunities to grow together with Tenaris. Tenaris has been a great uh, corporate partner with Buffalo Bayou Partnership by not only contributing financially to the organization, but also through their volunteer program. It's not just the financial commitment that Tenaris has made, it's the human commitment. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jack Mandona. It's uh, our honor and privilege to be here. I'm Germán Cura. I'm the Irish president for North America. And uh, it's uh, our honor Get to be here tonight. To tell you the truth, with a little overwhelm uh, in preparation for this, somebody told us, well, Germán, you might probably expect 100 people or so. <laughs> And uh, in the process, we learned that we created a traffic jam and everything else. So we, we truly apologize for that. <laughs> now, um, I have a tremendous number of people to thank. Um, but I realize 
that it is 610, uh, we have a busy schedule and it is our intent to provide you all not less than 45 minutes to ask questions about what we intend to do and how we intend to do it. So I would take uh, probably 10 minutes to present the NARIS uh, to you all. Uh, and then probably at the end, uh, take another three, four minutes to show you what we intend to build. But before that, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes to introduce the, what we call the US team. Uh, and I'll start with uh, probably Marcelo receiver, who is uh, an integral part of a US team, though he's the only one who doesn't live in the States, but he's been a major uh, contributor uh, for us to be here today. So here, thank here. you, Marcelo. Here, here. Chris North, uh, our CFO for North America. Alberto Agostini, our operations director for the United States. Pablo Fujimi, our engineering director for the US. Frank Sini, our supply chain director for the US. Just Groven, our steel sourcing director. Brad Lowe, our commercial director for the US. Jorge Samitier, key person, a procurement director for the US. Edgardo Lopez, a quality director for the US. Mark Portal, our CIO, a chief information officer for the US. Carmen Ortega, environmental director for the US. Paul Greenwald, part of our environmental team. And Karen Allen, a communications director for the US. So it's a very special day for us. We decided to all come and uh, make sure that we had the opportunity of addressing your questions, your issues, concerns, whatever it is. And uh, each one of us will be more than pleased to answer any questions that you may have. But before that, real quick, um, Tenaris. Kim, please. Who we are? Tenaris is the leading supplier of tubular goods for the oil and uh, gas industry around the world. Uh, we have a capacity of 6.5 million tons worth of uh, production. We manufacture in 16 countries. We have R&D centers in four. We employ 27 people around the world. We're a public company. Uh, we quote in the stock exchanges, New York, Milan, uh, Mexico, Argentina. Our revenues are about $10 billion a year, and North America accounts by just short of 50% of that. So uh, we tend to say that we planted in North America. We're not new to the States. It's a very important component of who we are as a company. Next. Now, uh, what we do, uh, we're a company that is focused in the energy space. We produce pipe applications which are used downhole on oil and gas wells, on pipelines, offshore and onshore, to conduct, transport oil and gas. Um, and we produce piping systems which are used on the processing plants, refineries and whatnot, and power generation plants as well. Next. Now this is the Tenaris footprint. Um, this is who we are. The Magenta points are our manufacturing facilities around the world. The rest are service centers, R&D centers, offices around the world. This is where we employ the 27,000 people. Um, and this is next. And this is what I call uh, presence in North America. Today, we operate uh, 17 manufacturing facilities in North America. We employ just short of 10,000 people. And as we saw before, we have a revenue base which is just north of $5 billion. But what we're trying to say is uh, this is a big company. Uh, this is a company that, as you saw in the video, was started long ago. And it's a company that over the years has grown to become not only the world leader, but um, probably more important one that is committed to do what we've done. Um, in preparation for the meeting, I was, well, greeting some of you. And um, I was asked, how long have you been with Tenaris? And I said, well, 25 years. And Marcelo, 28 years. 
San Alberto, 30 years. Uh, Tenaris is not only a job for some of us, it has become a very important part of our life, and this is what we intend to do in Bay City as well. Next. Next. What is that we intend to do? We announced this, but we thought that it was probably the proper time for us to get into a little bit more of the specifics. This is going to be our first seamless pipe in the US. You're going to get to hear this again and again. Uh, the two type of pipes, seamless and well, that the difference is one is used and uh, a little bit more complicated operating environments, high temperature, high pressure, gas, eagle for as an example. And welded pipe, we produce them both in the States, but this will be our first US seamless plant. This is an investment of 1.5. I know that somebody has said 1.3. Um, it is 1.5. And the difference is that some people looked at the investments that we're going to be doing directly associated to the production of pipes. And they have not accounted for the infrastructure that we intend to build, the centers, the service buildings, and whatnot. The investment is about $1.5 billion. The plan would be completed by mid-2016. As we indicated the date of the announcement, we have already filed the permit applications with TCQ. Uh, we understand that the process will take not less than six months to about nine. Uh, and we're ready to start construction immediately after the appropriate authorizations are put up in place. And it will take about uh, two years for us to build this new facility. Now, the production will be 600,000 tons, but I think the relevance um, of this slide from our perspective is this would create about 600 direct skilled jobs. Um, you'll see characteristics of the plant in a minute, and hopefully it will give you an impression as to how these pipes are produced and what is the role that our workforce would play. Now, it is also important, uh, and we never really talk much about it, but uh, experience shows that for every direct job we create, the community is in fact creating three more around. Logistic services, uh, machine shops that are going to work for us, uh, everything from hotels and uh, all sort of things which are ultimately then touched by the activity created for the plant. So overall, we're looking at about 24, 2,500 new jobs in the area. And we, as we have said, um, this is going to be a state-of-the-art facility. Probably next. This is what the facility is about. This is a site, a very brief sketch of what the layout is going to be like. Uh, this is part of a public record, uh, and by the way, by the end of a week, we're going to have in the public library a copy of the complete filing application that we just submitted. Uh, it will be a public document for everybody to go, look, study, research, and ask any questions. But I thought, and this is part of it, but I thought that it was um, somehow important for us to highlight a couple of things. Uh, number one, we acquired a property, or are in the process of completing the acquisition of a property, I should probably say, uh, which is give or take 1,500 acres. Uh, I usually use the reference that I was told by a colleague of mine um, in Europe. When I said that, he told me, but this is the size of the town where we have a plant. <laughs> are you sure that this is it? Uh, yes, we are. It is 1,500 acres. And the reason behind is we're doing this, as you've seen on the initial video, for decades. We build, we don't sell. This is an operating company. It's not an investment house. We're here to stay. We are hoping to become a member, a very active member of the community. So while designing the plant, 
we start thinking about how do we mitigate the impact of this? Uh, how do we make a difference? How do we do something which the manufacturing sector in the States has not seen in years? And you'll get to see the details along the way, but so you know, this plant will have a green belt of not three lines of trees, not three meters or yards, but 300. We intend to isolate the plant away from the rest of the town, the traffic, the city. Uh, it is our intent to make sure that when we use the 35 road here, uh, we just get to see 300 yards of green space. Uh, the design of the plant, probably next. The design of the plant uh, is uh, accounting for technology that would surpass the thresholds established by both the EPA as well as the state agency, TCQ. Uh, in the end, in the environmental world, we call it a minor source of emission. And this is uh, not the result only of the space that we buy, but more importantly, the technology that we're introducing. Uh, this is called this best available control technology. And it is something that could be done when we say we truly believe that uh, manufacturing in the States is, vi is feasible, is viable, is possible. It is driven by the renewed natural gas deposits that we have found. It is managed by the skilled workforce that we have. We're a company that has an existing presence in China and is one that has decided to invest in the States. Uh, we don't believe that we need to go to China to produce our products. Uh, Now, the plant would, be, would not be producing, and I know this came as a concern, so probably anticipating a question, but I thought that it was relevant. This plant would not produce steel. The steel bars out of which we produce the pipes would come from a facility that we have in Mexico. And that's why the agreement with uh, the Freeport authorities was very important. Access to a deep water port was essential are from where we intend to rail also the steel to a plant. Uh, and I don't know if we have any of the representatives of Freeport here tonight, but I, there. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> I think this is gonna make a dramatic difference at Freeport as well in terms of indirect employment. But we were very pleased with the level of conversations, discussions, and I tell you, we're gonna build up a terminal in Freeport that will be second to none. Now, uh, water we know uh, is also a key concern in the area. And uh, we intend to use our own water. Uh, it's gonna come out of the existing wells. But then also, importantly, is the notion of the majority, 97% of the water we use is recycled. So in the end, and we'll get into the specifics. I'm sure there are going to be questions around it. Um, we intend to use a lot less water than what is used today to water the farming activity that takes place on the existing site. So in the end, we're looking at it from a perspective where the area would have more water than what today has as a result of us putting up the plant in place. Well, the footprint I talked, and um, I need to say that it's been somehow difficult for us to internally explain it, but only 15% of the entire site will be built. Um, the rest will be open, and, uh, and as I said, surrounded by, by a green belt. Next. Traffic. We also know that it's an issue, a concern. As has indicated, the majority of the raw materials would come uh, from the port by a rail. Um, we anticipate that the impact in Bay City, given the location of the site, will be minimal. And uh, we intend, with the support of the state, the county, 
to build a, a bypass that would avoid Van Vleck entirely. And I must admit that in our conversations with the county, we were in the process of us acquiring land. And when it became a little bit difficult for us to explain the amount of land that we were buying, we were encouraged by the county to buy more. <laughs> <laughs> to facilitate the notion of building a longer bypass, therefore a lot more away from Van Black, which then we could have connected uh, to the existing site uh, at a level which is truly far away uh, from the city. Uh, we'll be very happy to share the specifics, and I'm sure there are going to be questions about it. Scrap and other metallics uh, and other things that we use will be all fully recycled. This is what we, by the way, do today in our existing plants. Uh, we rely on qualified third-party companies to process and recycle 100% of the waste that we produce, which is scrap, a metallic, uh, in the form of pieces of pipe that we cut, excesses, etc., etc. Noise reduction, we also know that uh, is an issue. Uh, that's why the green belt, that's why the notion of isolating it. But it's also a technology issue. This plant uh, will use chains to move the pipes. It would avoid pipes hitting one, and, and one to the other, creating the typical noise which we usually have experienced in the past. So we don't believe that this will be a concern. And uh, well, the, the water I talked is the 97% uh, recycled that uh, uh, I was telling you about, uh, the 3% that we intend to use. Sorry, no, the 3%, this is the waste water. Uh, the majority will be recycled, and the 3% pretreatment would be, uh, again, uh, sent off to the Bay City uh, Waste Water Plant for further treatment. So um, we didn't really want to take a tremendous amount of time. So while deciding on what else do we say, uh, I usually make fun of my accent, by the way. And I was very pleased to see the Governor Perry while I was saying so. Uh, he also apologized for his accent. <laughs> <laughs> but at one point, in preparation for this meeting, I said, look, I could talk and talk. Let me share with you in three and a half minutes, four at the most, what this plant is going to look like. And for that, I'm going to use a video which we shoot while completing the construction of a very similar plant that uh, in 2010 we just completed in Mexico. So it will not be exactly the same from a size perspective. Here we'll do a slightly bigger pipes than this one does. But from a technology perspective, from um, a structural perspective, um, it would provide, I think, a very good understanding of what a seamless plight looks like. This is not a machine shop. Uh, this is not a place uh, where you have a uh, few people around a small machine. Uh, this is what we intend to hear. Kim, please.
so um, thank you all very much. Uh, and I think uh, we'll be very happy to take any questions uh, that anybody would have, for which I think we have Magda helping us out. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Magda Morales. I've been a resident of Matagorda County for 24 years and uh, proudly the speech and debate coach at Bay City High School for the last 16 years. Also a great place to work. I may add. The process will be pretty simple tonight. We certainly welcome your questions. Um, what we will do is, uh, if you do have a question, just kind of raise your hand or let us know and we'll recognize you. Uh, someone will bring a mic to you. I believe there will be two, uh, two assistants with mics on the sides, uh, in the aisles. They will bring a mic to you. Uh, do please state your name if possible and ask your question. We do ask that you try to keep questions brief so that we can get to as many people as possible in the next 30 minutes or so. At this time, we will open the floor then for the first question. Who would like to start the discussion tonight? Let's see. Well, I know they did a great job. <laughs> they gave us a lot of info. <laughs> but yes, sir, Mr. Grevy, thank you. So groundbreaking will start within six months or so, depending upon the permits. And there's the mic coming to you. Thank you, okay. Mr. Grevy. I'm Lynn Grevy. I'm a local attorney here. Uh, we're excited to have you here. Uh, my understanding, your groundbreaking will start. You've got some permits to do, so it takes six to nine months. So when are you thinking about being able to start doing the dirt work? Groundbreaking will uh, start immediately after we get the formal authorizations. We expect that to be within six to eight months. Correct. Okay. Six to eight months from today? <laughs> <laughs> well, considering that we filed the permits on the 15th of February, I think the answer is yes, from, yeah, from the get, 15th of February. You have good lawyers, you ought to be able to do it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sir? I got it. I'm Bobby Head. Uh, I'm a <laughs> longtime resident of Matagorda County, fifth generation actually. Uh, we understand that y'all have uh, leased the uh, energy building to put your offices in. Uh, when do you expect, uh, one question is, when do you expect to open that and how many people there? And also, uh, during the construction of the plant, could we uh, get an estimate of how many employees you're looking at out at uh, during the construction phase? Excellent question. Well, thank you. Thank you very thank you, much. Uh, short answers. Our office is already open. Uh, we have um, our people there and it will grow naturally over time. And it's an important point because I'll use the question to also say that as we speak, we are inviting uh, people to come and, uh, and ask questions, understand a bit more about the Naris, uh, but then also uh, people would be interested in employment, so it's an opportunity for the people to be registered. Uh, people would be interested in understanding our procurement practice, and this is something that we're encouraging. So I would encourage everybody in the room uh, to pay us a visit, uh, let us know who you are, what you do. Um, in fact, we're searching for people who could help us provide logistic services and uh, ser uh, machine shops, uh, support services. Uh, it is our intent to build this facility with uh, direct participation of the community. Now, with respect to the number of people, uh, I believe that at the peak, the construction will take about 2,000 to 2,500 people. It will grow over time as well, and we're hoping that um, Bay City, Van Blake, and the surrounding areas would have uh, an opportunity to, in fact, uh, join us at that point. In the perfect world, we like the people to participate during the construction and then a good number of them remain as our direct full-time employees when the time comes, when completion is there. Mrs. Collins. Mrs. Collins and then the gentleman in the back. What kind of specialized training will the employees need who are going to work in the plant once it's operational? Well, that, that's an excellent question because um, um, we will staff this facility from the top management 
all the way down. Um, another reason why we want to understand details, specifics about what's available, who's interested, what the skill level is. Uh, there's also the notion of we want to uh, prepare ourselves ahead of time and having a good proxy as to uh, what the profile, the experience, the skill set, the level of preparation of uh, the community is, we could then in one second move into what are the training requirements, something which we would like to start doing sooner rather than later, and, and we will. But uh, the short answer to your question is uh, this facility would employ highly skilled mechanical electricians which would be part of the maintenance course. These are very specialized trades, all the way down to people who has no prior experience. Um, this is why I said that I have 25 years with the company. I tell you when I joined, it was right out of, out of school. There's nothing I knew at that point in time, if I know something now anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the jobs would uh, cover pretty much the whole scale and uh, will be welcoming people now for us to determine how do we need to tune our training programs to in the end provide the applicants the components, training components that we believe are required. Thank you. I believe Mr. Mr. Smith or Mr. Battle in the back. If you look around you, you see a lot of people that have white hair, gray hair, <laughs> and they need to work too. Will you make a commitment to hire older workers? Oh, absolutely. Uh, this is not um, about age at all. Um, it's about becoming part of a project. Uh, so short answer is yes. Excellent. Other questions on the floor at this time? Thank you, Cecily. Uh, where exactly, uh, you say it's on Highway 35, is that east of uh, Jackson Co-op or west of it, or whereabouts more specifically on 35 is this plant to be located? And have you selected an engineer and a constructor for this project? And if so, who are they? Well, I'm going to ask Marcelo so he could um, get to work a little bit as well. Marcelo, probably <laughs> you, could, you could share um, the location of the site. I'll, I'll, I'll take the engineering part. Well, the location is going to be 1,500 acres. Uh, and the main property is on, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. I was getting along very well without saying a word. <laughs> um, the property is on uh, Highway 35, uh, close to Van Bleck, so it is between Bay City and Van Bleck. And as for the engineering company, we're working now in defining which company is going to be accompanying us uh, in this project, and we're going to be deciding very soon. It will be announced very soon, uh, and we believe that all going well is one that is not going to surprise the community. It is one that's been engaged uh, in extensive work in the community in the past. We have a question right here in the back. We'll come to you, sir, and then to you. My name is Floyd Brown, and I have a question concerning OSHA. We live in a farming industry. Uh, allergies are very bad, but not only that, do you have a good report when it comes to OSHA, quality air control? Well, we couldn't hear you very well, but uh, would you mind? Um, repeat it. If question. you can rephrase it for, for us a little bit. I'm concerned about quality air control. Okay. Uh, do you have a good safety report and would we have any knowledge of that report? Oh, absolutely. I said uh, we, we understand the concern. The plant is being designed in a way that, that I tell you um, the level of emissions of this plant at all levels uh, would be well below the thresholds established by the state and federal agencies, which they will monitor, uh, I would say, as, as their own routine. Um, 
and I could give you a, a good number of technical details, but uh, we know we knew this was a concern, so I, I thank you very much for your question. Um, Greg, probably is a, an opportunity from our environmental team that um, you bring us a, a little bit of um, examples so we could address your concern not so much from a pure technical detail as to what are the parts per million and that type of thing, but um, when we have made evaluations, it will be all, by the way, part of this public record which you will have um, in the public library surely early next week. Uh, but I think Rick has a couple of comments. Uh, he is part of our environmental team. He's been extensively devoted to the analysis and presentation of this. So Greg, probably, um, why don't you please give us a couple of examples as to what uh, the missions uh, of the plan mean in terms of practical terms. All right, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, comparison or context of the emissions from this plant, um, the uh, emissions once the facility is fully constructed and operational will be less than 50% of the emissions that are generated by uh, the University of Texas at Austin's campus. So uh, significantly less than a, a public university. And uh, maybe another point of comparison is um, uh, looking at emissions from mobile sources, which are the cars and trucks in Matagorda County. It'll be less than 1% uh, of the emissions from those mobile sources. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So hopefully that answers your question. We have several questions on the floor. We will get to everyone. Gen for this gentleman first, and then to you, sir. My name is Willie Rollins, and I just want to say welcome to Matagorda County. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I was just curious if, if you all at liberty to tell us the, the origin of the name Tenaris. I'm just curious <laughs> about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, that, that will so probably require stories. another town hall, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be as brief as I possibly can. Um, Tenaris means a variety of things, but in many different languages. But uh, while researching for this, and some of us were deeply involved uh, in the definition of the name, while we were searching for a meaning, we found one that we uh, frankly, thought that it had a lot to do with who we are. And uh, tenaris means tenacity. And uh, this is the reason why we picked it. Okay. We have a question up front with Cecily. One more, Cecily, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Uh, David Malone. My question, well, I had two of them. One of them you have already answered, and one it was because of uh, using natural gas as fuel. The other one is you're going to be using water. You said 97% uh, of, of the water is going to come out of existing wells. What is that going to do to our groundwater? And then the other part of that question is 3% is going to the Bay City wastewater treatment. How is that going to be handled, and who's going to have to have to take care of those those extra responsibilities? Well, uh, thank you very much, Marcelo. Probably you want to take that mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's something that we need to clarify. Uh, it wasn't probably perfectly clear because we we, we don't intend to place. use 97 percent, but recycle. So it's going to be the same water used uh, over and over again. But Marcelo, maybe you want it's to what take we close uh, what we call a closed circuit. So the water will be you know recirculated 97 percent, and only three percent of all that is going to be uh, uh, we will have to replace it. And the amount of water that we're going to be using is a small fraction of the uh, water usage that you will be uh, having in the property today if you were just planting the usual crops. So it's a very small portion. As for the wastewater, um, we are already in discussions with the authorities in Bay City in order for them to take our water. It's going to be pre-treated in our plant, and then it's going to come out as if it were uh, wastewater from any other uh, source. So they will be finally treated in, the, in this uh, plant and then disposed in the usual manner. Does that yes. answer your question, sir? 
Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Cecily in the back, and then lady in the second row, please. I understand that you have several producing plants in the United States. Traditionally, what has happened to the property values of the land that adjoined that plant? Well, I, I tell you, um, the plants were there when we, in fact, uh, acquired a company. But um, the expectation we have in this case, uh, and uh, we had a little bit of an estimate, and I'll probably defer to Chris uh, to also help me out a bit uh, in terms of uh, economic impact that the plant, uh, the analysis of the economic impact that the plant would create in the area, which uh, we understand given the degree of development in terms of residential, the new hotels, and new level of activity, can nothing but help uh, the real estate space. But uh, I want to go from generics to specifics. So Chris, maybe you want to share with us the details of uh, the economic impact evaluation that we've done as a result of the plan. Yes, we had a third party uh, impact study done, economic impact study for this area, particularly for this project. And what it indicates is, is a very good uh, indication of about 2.6 billion when this plan is operation of economic impact. Now about 50% of that is related to our activities directly uh, in the community as that plan is operational. But the other 50% is, is all the indirect and induced functions that take uh, support this plan as we go forward. So it's a major in, uh, economic impact for this community and we have a lot of numbers. We have a report that will go public when we do a number of filings that you'll see uh, lots of uh, economic numbers, job numbers, as Hermond already mentioned, probably in the range of 1,800 jobs for the 600 jobs that uh, we are creating at this plant uh, will be in support of this, this plant. So a number of economic environments. As far as the question is uh, property values, what we've seen in our plants, and especially in this plant because of the way we're constructing it, being with a green field of 300 yards between all the different roads and, and the property, we believe it's gonna be a pretty plant, for one thing. It's gonna be attractive. We're gonna have a nice green belt, trees, and as we've seen in other plants, we don't see any deterioration uh, in surrounding areas of our, our property values. But we, in the most part, to be fair, most of our plants are more in industrial areas. So this is a little bit different. That's why we're putting the green belt in. That's where we're gonna have the buffer zone of, of 300 yards. I hope uh, that was a good question. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for your question. Good evening, my name is Linnell Saceda. Uh, thank you for such an awesome presentation. Um, I'm looking at your brochure and what intrigues me is your commitment to our community. And you said that you partner with local institutions and non-governmental organizations to develop sustainable programs that will, will provide a deep and lasting impact. Could you give us an example of one of those programs? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you. Please. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I think the judge here has been uh, praying for that question to be asked. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Your prayers have been uh, answered. Praise I, God. I, and, I, and, and I tell you what, uh, from my perspective, uh, because the judge had the opportunity of sharing with you all what the meetings were like back in June. And I need to say that it was precisely your question, uh, the one that I thought it clicked in our discussions with the county at that point in time. Um, we tend to say that Tenaris becomes a neighbor, is an active member of the community. But we go beyond saying, and I'll share with you examples. Uh, and these are, U.S. examples, because we're doing it all over the world. But, but I tell you, six years ago, we acquired a company called Maverick Tubulars, which has still does, a, a fairly important manufacturing facility in Hickman, Arkansas, where we employed about 1,000 people. Uh, I met 
with uh, Judge, Judge McGuire at the time. And I said what I'm saying today. This, look, this is who we are. This is what we do. Uh, this deals with notions of uh, community responsibility, community action, sustainability. Um, the best plant in the world is just not going to be enough if we don't devote the same level of attention to the community where we operate. So the question at that time was, Judge, what are the issues in the community? Because each one has its own, and we're here to help. <coughs> He looked at me, uh, of course, cut me a joke about my accent, and, uh, <laughs> and told me, look, Herman, uh, I could go on for hours, but, but the situation is very simple. Mississippi County, this is where we are, has uh, many companies like yourselves. Yourselves, Nucor, and others. Companies like yourselves would offer the employees over time, and they'll take it. The problem is that when mom and dad take the overtime, kids remain at the house without supervision. And in time, these kids transition through my courthouse. Can you help me out? Well, Courtney is here. By the way, she's in our uh, Bay City uh, office full time. She's a community relationships manager for the states. And uh, while discussing this, we said, you know, I understand. We're going to help to keep the kids off the street and create it. <laughs> and created what we now call an after school program. The after school program, to make it very short, is kids are offered to stay at school between three and six. We provide academic support to the kids that, for whatever reason, are doing lower than average. We provide additional incentives for the kids that are doing better than average to, in the end, try to see if we could extract or help extract the full potential. We put them together through sports and, and build the community. And just to make sure, before they go home, we provide a meal. And we're using the school infrastructure. And Richard Adwell, that you saw, is the guy with whom we partner, the school district superintendent, the guy with whom we partner. And uh, says, look, we need the schools. We're going to need uh, to use your buses. We offer the teachers also this additional job and income. Good, I'm a teacher, so. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, you know, school said, of course, we will be, and this will be additional income, and in the end, these are our kids and whatnot. Uh, Courtney, uh, remind me how many kids are we now um, looking after? About three to 400. We've impacted over 1,000 since we started the program. And I tell you, these are 1,000 kids, <laughs> and you will not believe the way their school results compared to the kids that, for whatever reason, decided not to join. So much that we were called by Governor Bibi at one point. And again, he says, look, uh, you guys are new. You speak funny, but you're doing something which we like. How can we help? I say, Governor, if you're willing to support this, because you know we cannot touch every kid in, in, in the county. But if you put the, you know, the appropriate things in place, uh, we could use existing platform to expand it, which we're doing. So with that, this is an example that is, as we speak, taking place in Hickman, Arkansas. Sometime later, I tell you about the uh, technical after school program that we're about to start for young adults, also in the same area. Thank you. You have. We have two questions right up here. I see one with Cecily and one in the center of the audience will be right with you. Hi, my name is Colin Davis. I'm a student at Bay City High School. And talking about the education, that's great. Thank you all very much for doing that. I can tell, you know, I'll definitely be there just <laughs> for that tutoring. Uh, but also, talking about uh, education, is Tanara's going to be providing any higher educational opportunities for the students at the high school that are graduating and starting to enter the workforce? Well, David, this is an excellent question. And uh, uh, 
Uh, I tell you, back to higher education, we run a program that we call nothing else but Tenaris University. Uh, and this is a program where we train people like you from all over the world on uh, processes, on um, financial matters, on commercial matters. Uh, and we have a full-fledged university with campus with uh, people like me and Marcelo and Chris acting as uh, instructors. Uh, and some of us spend a considerable amount of time uh, doing it. Uh, the United University will have a U.S. campus soon, and uh, we intend to use it as a platform to train people like you uh, and others that decide to join the company. Um, now, we also do summer jobs. Uh, we also do things, as uh, I was saying, uh, technical after-school programs where we go to the technical schools, for instance, and, and people like Alberto, our operations director, becomes a mechanical trainer, and we, in the end, try to transfer some of the experience and knowledge. We open up the plants for summer jobs for people like you to join us during the summer and provide the opportunity for people like you to experience what working in an industrial environment is like. So we have uh, many answers to the issue, and this is something that um, we feel very strong about, we feel a, a, a very strong passion for. Uh, we believe it's structurally important. But it deals with the point that I was making before. The best machine in the world is not enough. Everything we can do to improve the quality of the communities where we operate is a, an instrumental part of what we do in our job. Okay, well, thank you very much. a question here, then to the back, Cecily, one more, and then in the center of the house. Hello, my name is uh, Robert DeWitty, and I have a question about uh, what would the average salary be for a skilled worker in the plant, and what kind of benefits do you offer? And also a question for uh, uh, the judge is on taxes in the community. We're talking about bringing in six, seven hundred new uh, employees into the community. Um, so kind of as a taxpayer concern, uh, what kind of you know, I have a concern that my, my house values go up, my tax rates go up. How do you see that impacting me on my, on my taxes as a homeowner? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, Mr. DeWoody, certainly I can speak to the, uh, the tax aspect of your question, and it's a very good one, and thank you for it. Uh, but what I can tell you is what I set out to do six years ago was to grow the industrial base of Matagorda County and to build a county. That's precisely what we're doing this evening, and we'll ask our friends here with Tenaris, but also the ancillary businesses and support businesses that come along who will pay future taxes. What that allows us to do at the commissioner's court level is to lower the tax rate. Now, your values hopefully will go up because we want your property to be worth, certainly, be worth more. But certainly the way that we allay that is to continue to build the tax base for you in an effort to uh, lower our tax rate to you. Very well, and I'm and I'm not clear on the I'm not clear on the first the question. First no, I I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one. Uh, I think is the first one <laughs> uh, for for me to take. But the initial analysis shows that the average salary for our employees at the plant would be in the area of about sixty six thousand dollars a year. And uh, back to the benefits, uh, where we have um, medical benefits where the employee uh, can opt between the various different medical plans that we have. Uh, of course, we have uh, pension benefits in the form of uh, 401k, uh, which, uh, which uh, or where the company adopts a matching formula depending upon the contribution of the employee as well. Um, so we, we like to think that our benefits package is uh, more than competitive relative to our peers. But um, Chris, uh, you have a, a large experience on this. Probably you want to uh, also take the floor and, and expand. Yes, yeah, so I think expanding on the benefits package, certainly we've been very competitive. Herman and I sit on a committee with a number of the HR folks in Tenaris and the Houston office to benchmark our, our benefits package against all of our competitors against uh, other big industries in, in uh, the Houston area and those kinds of areas and in, in Arkansas that where we have different plants, in Louisville where we have a plant, 
in Conroe, which is north of Texas, uh, north of Houston. So we have a number of uh, different benchmarks that we look at our benefits, and we're, we're very competitive. We look at it uh, uh, every year. It gets more expensive every year, like all of you know. It gets more expensive, but uh, we're working on ways, adding new types of plans that employees can opt into so that uh, they can reduce the expenses out of their pocketbook and, and still keep the company in sort of a level playing field, you might say, as, as we move forward in our badness package. So I think it's, it's, it's very comparable and it's, it's gonna be a good package for, for this part down here. Now the 66,000 uh, that Herman uh, uh, spoke about is the right average salary for that plant. Certainly, there, as, as we've said, there'll be different lines of management, different lines of operators, different lines of engineering, uh, accountants, IT folks. So it's going to run the whole gamut of the uh, job industry for to support this plant. So there's going to be certainly a number of different uh, salaries and scales that we'll see. But 66,000 is what we've seen in our estimate so far uh, for the average of, of the plant. Thank you. Thank you. Cecily, then the gentleman on the side. Okay. Hello, my name is Preeti. And I just willing to know that um, your supply trucks will use the diesel. So you will have your own diesel tanks, or this business will come to the nearby town area? The diesel tanks? Yes, sir. we're going to have our own diesel tanks, or we're going to be using the ones of the area. I'm sorry. No. We will not have uh, diesel tanks no, we for won't. those trucks. No, no. We, this is, in, pa in fact, part of this uh, indirect impact that we were talking about. Uh, and in fact, it's very important for us to precisely understand uh, what are the area uh, service facilities that we could count on, uh, a reason why our procurement guys led by, by Jorge here are uh, already established in our Bay City office trying to understand the landscape uh, to, in the end, determine what is that we could locally uh, procure. Thank you. Kevin Anderson with Happy Radio. First, I want to welcome you to the community. Thank you. I've got two questions for you. First, how much more rail traffic can we expect through Bay City when you're in operation? And second, is the physical plant going to be in the Bay City ISD School District, the Van Vleck School District, or both? Excellent. Marcelo, you might, you might want to take that. Yeah. Um, as for the rail traffic in Bay City, we expect it to be uh, not affected. It's going to be minimal. Uh, most of the rail traffic that we will have will be coming in from the port of Freeport. And as Germán was mentioning, we will be building a, an ad hoc terminal for that. And we're already in discussions with uh, the port of Freeport. So that traffic of raw material is going to be done by rail. It will not affect Bay City at all. You will have, we will have some uh, truck traffic for the uh, final product, that is our pipe. But again, we've done our analysis and that impact is gonna be minimal in Bay City. Uh, most of the impact is uh, expected to be on the axis of 35 crossing through Van Vleck. That's why, as we discussed before, we've engaged early in discussions with the county and with the judge to uh, work for this uh, project of the bypass, which is already uh, under consideration. And you had a second question? Ah, yes. Uh, it's going to be in the Van Vleck School District. But if I may, if I may point out, uh, I think that the, you have to look at the project not as whether you know, the limits of the school district are here or there. Our employees are going to be uh, all around, and I think they're going to be impacting and benefiting uh, the school districts uh, in general in this area, and we've had already discussions with both Van Vleck School District and Bay City uh, School District. So I think it's going to be a benefit bo for both. With the question in the middle of the house, and that, let's go ahead if we can to this very patient, patient lady, go ahead. And Cecily, if we can get the mic to the center of the house. You can go ahead first. Steve. 
my name <clears throat> my name is Georgia Harris and I've lived here forever <laughs> and <laughs> we welcome Tanaris but I would also like to know if your 600 expected permanent employees will be encouraged to live in Matagorda County and not be commuting like to Lake Jackson and Houston, we would certainly welcome 600 new families. Well, thank you, thank you for, for your question and uh, short answer is yes. Um, and there's, naturally there's, there's so much we can encourage, but, but uh, there's a rationale behind and it deals with, uh, with safety, it deals with limiting um, you know, people on, on the cars on the way home after the night hour shift. Uh, so, um, yes, the answer will be yes, but ultimately it will be up to the potential employees to make the final decision as to, as to where do they want to leave. Cecily. Um, name is Charles Corporan. I was born in been near most of my life in this county. My question is on the, um, the 1,800 indirect jobs. Could you characterize, you, you've touched on some of them like the Freeport plant and also uh, businesses that would support the plant and obviously um, things around town to support 600 more employees. Could you characterize about how many of those would be in uh, certain, those areas? Well, it's a difficult one because it depends precisely on what the area can offer. And the reason why I think is the third time that I'm insisting on encourage everybody to let us know uh, what are the services that we could find in the area. Um, the type of services are give or take the ones that I was, in fact, uh, mentioning at the beginning, construction services, uh, transportation, logistics, uh, uh, machine shop services uh, and whatnot. Uh, it's only been a week. Uh, I think, um, Jorge, you would have a, an indication as to how many people has already approached us and, in fact, uh, described the level of services, capabilities, things that they could potentially do. It will be important that we share that and, again, use the opportunity to um, encourage everybody to uh, let us know. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have been contacted so far by more than 60 potential suppliers. Uh, as Herman mentioned, um, we will use machine shops, um, suppliers of um, mobile equipment, uh, civil contractors, uh, companies having mechanic, mechanics, welders, and so on for our, for our repair uh, activities. Um, Material equi equipment suppliers, uh, MRO materials, um, MRO materials, and several other other um, uh, suppliers. Uh, we invite everybody who would like to become a supplier to email us at baycitysuppliers@tenaris.com, and we will we'll make sure to answer every contact. Thank you. We do have time for just one more question. I know there's still several on the floor, and we, we apologize if we can't get to all the questions tonight. Um, so we need to answer the question off to this side first. We have been waiting. I'm sorry to, sorry, Todd. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Susan Dancer. I'm a small business owner in the community, very excited to be hearing about the plant. And I'm, I know we've had our local officials have worked really hard to bring uh, a project, a large project to the community that was a good fit for the resources we have here in the employee base. And I'm wanting to know what incentives we were able to offer um, on the county level and what Tenaris's commitment will be as far as tax abatements and, and that type of thing. Yes, I'll take that one, Susan, and thank you for the question. It's a valid one. Um, certainly, as we're in a competition with 12 to 14 other sites across several states and many 
large urban areas. Uh, there are the counties right next to us, you know, Harris, Brazoria, Oasis County. Um, this was a heated competition. And I'll admit that our commissioner's court stepped up, uh, stepped up and offered abatement, a 10-year abatement to the, to the project and also some Section 380 treatment thereafter. Uh, we've also had uh, the whole of the county uh, there, there's, in their special districts to step up uh, and offer abatements as well, the drainage districts, the groundwater districts, uh, those sorts, the Port of Bay City Authority. Um, we've had our school districts come in and help as they can. But this was an all-out uh, bid that had to be put together if we were going to be competitive. Um, the county asked us to go out and bring um, a good fit, as you, in, in your words, um, and we heard you. Uh, this represents that. These people are gas-fired. They're not coal-fired. They're gas-fired, good, clean, domestically produced natural gas. And um, we put together a very good offer at the end of the day. Didn't match up to, to most of our competitors. But what I think I may have failed to say in my opening remarks was that Tenaris is not looking for a incentive bonanza, but they're looking for a logistic and societal fit. And Matagorda County represents that for them. Um, so to answer your questions, yes, we did put together a very nice incentive package, but I can assure you it was much, much less than our competitors. Thank you. The panel had agreed, I guess, I think, acquiesced to answering maybe one or two more questions. Is that okay? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Todd, if, you, if we could please then. Hi, Todd Duncan. I had a quick question about, in your presentation, I saw a reference to LEED certified building, and I wondered if you could uh, discuss that a little bit for us, so that as we're, as we're contemplating sort of what environmental impacts this plant's going to have on us, um, how we should reference that LEED, um, that LEED certification. Um, well, I, I tell you a, a little bit about it, then I would probably rely on, on, on Paul or, or Carmen to expand. But think about LEED certification. Uh, this would be the first plant that would be uh, LEED certified. Uh, and uh, as you know, LEED certification means very specific, uh, very stringent ways of managing energy, energy conservation, uh, insulation that you use, recycling that you do, uh, monitor, um, uh, control, verified, and whatnot. Um, it's fairly unique in our industry. There's no other faci elite facility, pipe manufacturing lead facility in the States. This will be the first one. And we believe that it deals with uh, a long-term view as to how things uh, would need to be done, not today, but in time. We convince that environment and environment management and environment cautiousness um, would be a demand much more than an intent. Um, and uh, we've been pushing for it, and we're going to continue to do so. Um, now, uh, we're going to need to work big time uh, to get the certification done. It's a lot easier to be said than done. The plant that you saw, uh, the last plant that we built in Mexico, is being already LEED certified. And um, this is where we gain, I believe, the necessary experience to know what to do uh, to obtain it, and we're very confident that we will. We have a question right here in the back, and then to you, ma'am. Hello, my name is Isaac Lemus, and I'm a lifelong resident of Bay City. I had two questions for you. Um, the first one is, after Tenaris becomes operational and 2016, um, will, there, will there be room, I mean, will there be opportunity for expansion um, to create more jobs on top of the 600 jobs that y'all create? And the second question is, you mentioned that 97% per, of the water y'all be using is recycled and 3% will be new. 
uh, will there be an absolute change to that or a percentage change or is that solid? Well, a short answers, um, we, we frankly at this point um, have no contemplated expansion plans. Um, but um, the way the industry goes, the conviction we have about manufacturing in North America, um, we're not closing any doors. Now, with respect to the proportions, I don't see that changing. There's no reason for that to be so uh, going forward. Hopefully, that, that answers the question. Yes, I'm June Newton, and I was just wondering, in your hiring process, will veterans be given any special consideration? Oh, thank you, ma'am, for asking that question, because uh, they are being given that consideration today. Uh, we today employ about um, 4,000 people, just short of 4,000 people uh, in the States. And we are, in fact, searching for ways to connect them. And we're doing it in Texas, we're doing it in Arkansas and Kentucky, where we operate. Uh, we'll absolutely do it again uh, in Bay City when the time comes. Were there any other questions on the floor? I think we've, okay, there's a couple on this side. We may, I'm sorry, Mr. Bobby. Thank you, Bobby, we'll get, we'll get to you later. My name is Mike Dinn, and first, thank you, thank you, thank you for choosing Bay City of Matagord County. Uh, my question actually is, my question actually is more for Judge McDonald or, or Mayor Bricker. Bay City and Matagord County have historically fallen short of providing adequate housing. Now's our time to step up and offer some development. What do you see in the future for adequate housing? Thank you, Mike. That's a great question and I'm glad you asked it. I'd like to get around front here and draw a nice starting line for us and I can get down in a track pose as uh, sprinters do as they're about to take off on 100 meters, because this isn't gonna be a marathon. This is something that's gonna unfold very quickly. I can tell you that DC Dunham is working tirelessly right now to line up those folks who were at the starting line to build new housing in Matagorda County. And I'm talking about both permanent and a new high-end uh, rental property, an apartment complex. I've uh, long had a dream to build a gated community here with water features and all those things that I see in Fort Bend County. I believe that'll happen uh, with, re with regards to this project. DC is working very, very hard on that. And to answer your question uh, in a short way, and I apologize for having not done that, but I'm very excited when you ask me because yes, indeed, there will be new housing. We are working on that and we are in, in conversation even as we speak with developers and builders who will come to Matagorda County and build that new inventory for us. Thank you. Hello. There you okay, go. I know I've already had my question, but this one actually has to do with uh, Judge McDonald also. A very important question to the citizens of Bay City, the schools here, we were talking about this being in the Van Vleck Independent School District. Uh, I would like to challenge each of us and the judge to uh, maybe talk to the governor, you've become friends with the governor, Jay Kimbrough, guys like that, to possibly change the boundary line for the schools. Now wait a minute, I, I'm, not, no, I'm not, now wait a minute, wait a minute, <laughs> hear me out here, and divide, divide it among Van Vleck and Bay City, because Van Vleck is still gonna be, if they had half the plant, they're still gonna be in the Robin Hood plant, which is gonna, they're gonna have to give money away, and then half of it in Bay City, well, they'll get some of the subsidies. It wouldn't cut Van Vleck out at all. You know, that's, that's not what I'm saying, is cut Van Vleck out. I'm saying divide it where, where each, each school district could get some, because we've learned over the years with STP that most of the people live in Bay City. With this plant, most of the people are gonna live in Bay City, and they're gonna educate their children in Bay City, but we'll be the only school in Matagorda County that's not in the Robin Hood plan if this goes through. So, so I'm not saying, you know, I, I know you guys laughing, but, but it's, a, it's a true 
uh, benefit if we were to divide the plant just right down the center and give half of it to Bay City ISD and half of it to Van Vleck <laughs> ISD, and then we could get some money. So, <laughs> so Bobby's question is if there's a way to redrawing those boundaries. <laughs> Uh, Bobby, I, I, I expect there's always a way, but um, what I would say is you lead the parade and I'll play the drums. <laughs> um, you know, the, the benefit for Bay City ISD, as you know, uh, is not the tax bases, but the average daily attendance that's going to ensue from the new children who will come here and uh, attend primarily Bay City schools. Uh, Bay City, of course, is the largest ISD in the county. and um, in my mind, they're going to get uh, a large number of new children to attend their schools and, of course, the average daily attendance that ensues. Um, and certainly, uh, that's something that would have to be taken up at the Texas Education Agency or, or whomever that governing body is, and, and um, Superintendent Brown, Superintendent O'Brien would, would need to even advise me as to how to undertake that, I'll admit. But good question, a valid one, and in a perfect world, certainly that would be the case. Um, and, and I expect that maybe that conversation is had at a later date. Thank you, though. Go ahead. There's a question in that side of the house. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's right back here and then to you, ma'am. My name is Carolyn Volkmer, and I am. I'm the generation that left. I have four generations of my family that was here before me, and I have two generations of my family after me that have come to Bay City to live their lives. We're talking about y'all coming in and y'all gonna create these jobs and it's gonna help one of the school districts, which is awesome. I'm all about helping any school district. I don't care which one it is. Um, Judge, you were saying that you're, you're on the starting line. You're ready to run with this apartment complex and with some more communities with permanent housing. What are we going to do to keep my grandchildren here? This, this, is, this, is, the, this is the only thing bad I've ever said about Bay City, but what are you gonna do to keep my grandchildren here? Because there's nothing here to do. I have lived in Bay City. I have. I was born in Bay City. I've lived here for seven weeks. Yes, ma'am, and that's a fair question, and thank you for it. And what I can tell you is that uh, since I took office in 2007, I've worked with uh, now a total of eight theater providers. We had a meeting today at 3:30 that was canceled um, because the gentleman from Bastrop, frankly, who's built the uh, theater down there, is father, I believe it was DC, was taken ill and he couldn't make the meeting. We've had a number of meetings with him. He's built them around. Um, you probably know that local investors have bought the bowling alley and you probably see that that's uh, being rebuilt. It's completely, completely gutted. It's going to be a state-of-the-art facility. Uh, and, but what I would tell you, the absentee in all of this has been an anchor tenant. You know, we have the South Texas Nuclear Project. It's a wonderful edifice. They do very good things. Many of their people drive to Brazoria County and other parts of the region to live. Um, we have Oxea, we have Selenes, we have Lyondell Bissell and Conoco Phillips. We have many, many good employers. Uh, what we don't have, though, is a new influx of payroll capital into our county for a very long time. This industry represents, just by their direct employment, upwards of $40 million annually. $40 million. That's going to increase our per capita income here. It's going to make our demographic look much more favorable to those that we speak to. And I can tell you that I've visited with Academy on two occasions since I've been in office asking them to locate here. I can assure you I'll be visiting with them again. And I'll have a better reception. And there are many, many others. But the way we get there, is to improve our demographic, to continue to bring new payroll dollars into our market, just like what Tenaris represents, but also the ancillary jobs. Um, that's going to be way upwards of 60, 70 million dollars annually of new capital into this market. And those are the things that corporate America and, um, and entertainment venues look at. We're gonna work on this and we'll continue to work on it. And we have been working on it, but we've had to bring in a good company like this 
to drive the nail home and to close the deal. We'll do that for you. It's a valid question. Thank you. We have one last question, it looks like, uh, from a f local fourth grade teacher. <laughs> yes, local fourth grade teacher. I'm happy to be here in Bay City. Um, I've worked much here in Bay City over the last 35 years. Uh, I welcome y'all here. Thank you very much for being here. I feel like I come very much from opposite spectrum as what has already been discussed here tonight. I appreciated your question very much on the veterans here, whether or not they would have a greater opportunity to find employment in this place or not. Um, <clears throat> I work here, volunteer work um, with the Matagorda County Jailhouse. Um, uh, for a number of years, I've been a member of the South Texas Prison Outreach System. Uh, serving prisons in South Texas and one of our main goals is to try to teach people to live different than what got them into trouble in the first place and for many of the people that we work with criminal behavior I feel myself trembling or shaking <laughs> excuse me uh, many of the people that we work with criminal behavior is pretty much all they know and so it's like trying to, you know, teach an old dog new trips, tricks. Uh, some are receptive to a different lifestyle that will give them a different outcome in life. And some of them are just waddle in the same disaster that they've been in for much of their life. And my question, my concern would be this. What we find more than anything else is that because of their behavior, and it's, you know, their choice, I understand that, I believe very much in if you're going to do the crime, then you need to be willing to do the time also. I believe in consequences for your behavior. But also, we have come to meet you know, people that are 18 or 20 or 25 years old who now have felonies and will never work in the medical field. They'll never be allowed to work in the educational field or anywhere else that they do any kind of background check because of the choices that they've made as young men and women. And it's hard for these young adults to find a job, a legal job, when their options are very limited next to zero on one side and their life of crime on the other that will buy their alcohol and drugs for this weekend. And our job, you know, we try to, to help them to get out of that lifestyle, but there's very few options for them. So my question is this, will your company have any kind of openings or opportunities for young adults or medium, mid-age adults who have made mistakes, bad choices in their lives, that are willing to go out and try to do something different? Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much for your question. I, I have to say um, that we have not specifically thought about the, the point you bring in, uh, but we recognize this as a valid one and a serious one. Uh, but um, let me try to answer this in in a slightly different way. Uh, we at Tenaris would be open to offer jobs to community participants that are ready and willing to join the company on something that would hopefully mean and would go beyond a paycheck. Um, part of the reasons why we, we're here is the moment that in a conversation with some of the community actors, and the judge mentioned some of the existing companies that are operating in the county, we soon found that uh, these companies are, open, and by and large, are big industrial operating companies, are operating with turnover rates of about 2-3%. Um, this, to us, meant a world, given that if we really want to believe that we are able to operate a safe, 
industrial environment. Uh, the so-called industrial averages of about 25%, in some states is even north of that, are frankly not sustainable. It means that you have people coming in and out pretty much every day, uh, that you need to train people in and day in, day out, on safety practices, on risk analysis, on clear understanding of what the issues that they need to be aware of while performing the job is about. And uh, I tell you, with um, the so-called industrial averages, it's, been, uh, it's, prov it's proven to be very challenging. Now, 2 or 3% turnover rates were to us uh, precisely an indication of uh, community, uh, were a clear indication of stability. And like um, most of you have said, uh, an indication that, uh, in fact, this is the place where the majority of us would like our grandchildren, grandchildren to stay. Um, this is a very important reason why we're here, and this is what we're going to try to offer our employees going forward. I think that was the last question. Uh, from the floor this evening. I know we have a lot of, uh, thank you first of all for coming out. Wonderful questions for our panel. Is there anything else that? that you no, just a final uh, word. Thank you, Marga, very much for, for the wonderful job. I know that. <laughs> moderating a, a debate uh, of uh, just short of uh, 900 people is not easy, but you're in the high school every day, so I, I, I know <laughs> you have the appropriate experience. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thanks for the support. Thanks for the interest. Uh, thanks for your presence. And uh, it's going to take time, but we're here to stay. And uh, the Naris Bay City will be a, an up and running plan very soon. Thank you all very much. Judge, you might want to probably have a closing remark. Well, I, uh, I just I want to thank Tenaris for their uh, confidence in us and their obvious commitment to us. And now it's our turn to go out and help them build a, a winning facility that we're all proud of. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out this evening, and God bless you.